Hi everyone, um, I'm back again. And if you're not watching this live, then you probably need to sub up. I hope you're watching this because you've got your GCSE physics tomorrow. If you're A-level, then this is probably not gonna be the feed for you. I'm just gonna go through five things that are probably gonna come up in your GCSE exams tomorrow, five kind of key areas that you can make sure that you get um, good marks in your GCSEs tomorrow. Okay, those five things are models of the atom, Boyle's law and other kind of pressure and gas laws stuff, conservation momentum problems, circuit problems, and half-life. Okay, so I've been asked to do that half-life one there. So I'm going to um, whiz through those now. I am literally surrounded by uh, whiteboards that I've scribbled down bits that I want to show you and tell you about. Um, this is probably going to take about 20 minutes. What I'll do is I'll stop and I'll get to your chat. Um, if, you want, if you want to ask questions or anything like that, I'll stop in between each one and I will get to your chat um, uh, if you want to ask questions about each one and then I'll just do any Q&As just at the end. Okay, so starting with models of the atom. Okay, this is my first one here. There's kind of five of them. You need to know a lot of detail about Thomson and Rutherford's model. But really, this section of the syllabus is not only about kind of a development of a really important model and how we get to the Bohr model that we use today, but it is also um, about how evidence changes models. So I would memorize the evidence and some of the simplest questions on this. So actually, what evidence did Thompson have to lead to his plum pudding model? Okay, so, so make sure you memorize these things. Now, Democritus initially, they thought that the atom was just a, the smallest thing. Okay, that was all they said. Everything's made out of something really small that you can't divide anymore, and they called that an atom, which means indivisible. Um, they didn't have any evidence, really, apart from a thought experiment, that if you keep cutting a piece of cheese, for example, you eventually get to a piece of cheese you can no longer cut, and that would be called a, um, that would be called a uh, atom, something undivisible. Now, Dalton was a chemist, really, okay, and did lots of chemical equations, and all that stuff in chemistry you do with conservation of mass, that was his evidence. And he said, yes, atoms are indivisible, but um, they're, they're all a bit different from one another. So some have a larger mass than others. So in other words, he measured the masses of different moles of, of different things, and that's going to be more likely to come up in your chemistry exams. Okay, now Thompson, he um, was working with things called cathode rays, and a cathode is a negative terminal, so a cathode ray is a stream of electrons, a beam of electrons, right? So he'd found and he'd worked with these things that um, must have come from somewhere, and he said, well, they must come from, therefore, within the atom. So he added to Dalton's things, well, you can actually divide it, you can get electrons out of them. So that's Thompson's evidence for the plum pudding model. He took Dalton's things, they recognised there was something with negative charge that could come out of an atom. So he said they were like the plums in a plum pudding. So the plum pudding model states we've basically got equally dispersed positive charge in a kind of cake, okay, equal mass everywhere as well, and these smaller, less massive things that you can take out that are negative. Rutherford did the alpha particle scattering experiment, okay, the gold foil experiment, you might know that as. Most of the alpha particles went straight through the gold foil, therefore most of the atom is empty space. Very few were deflected, and even fewer still were deflected through large angles. So there must be a concentration of mass and a concentration of positive charge, because we know the alpha particles, he knew the alpha particles were positive. All right, and the Bohr model explains why the electrons didn't just spiral down and into the nucleus, which is what would happen if we just had Rutherford's um, uh, evidence. So Bohr said the electrons must have this fixed amount of energy of which they orbit in. And that fixed amount of energy we call now the energy levels. So those are the five different models. That's the evidence there. Okay, so screenshot. <laughs> memorize that stuff there. It's not just about these two, it's about how evidence changes theories. And I've seen a lot of questions on like Democritus and stuff like that, and people are like, what, what do you mean? Why are we asked about what evidence they had? <laughs> they didn't have any evidence. All right. Um, just a little point here, what about Chadwick? Chadwick, um, certainly in the syllabus that I, I, I teach, doesn't really come up in the physics, it does come up in the chemistry, because Chadwick was the discoverer of the neutron. So the neutron is obviously a, a nucleon, it's a, it's a nuclear particle. Equal mass of proton, but no charge. All right, next bit. P1, V1 equals P2, V2. Well, this is the equation you get given in your exam, which actually reads as pressure times volume equals a constant. Now, that's almost always going to be used to calculate a pressure after a change or a volume after a change. So they're going to tell you the pressure and volume before a change and tell you the pressure and volume after the change, right? 
So you can either work out the constant and then go ahead and use that constant to do a bit more calculation, or you can just memorize that equation I've just given you. So as I said, this is how it's given in the formula sheet, PV equals a constant, or you can memorize this one. And that's more useful to me. I think that's more useful because all I need to do then is recognize the pressure and volume beforehand, sub the numbers in, recognize which one they've told me out of these second ones, put that number in, and then rearrange. All right, I hope that makes sense. These questions are really quite simple. Now, what does that mean in kind of practice, and what is Boyle's Law? Boyle's Law states that pressure and volume are inversely proportional. Now, all that is the same maths there. So you might want to memorize this equation, this, sorry, this graph little sketch here. Pressure and volume inversely proportional. It means if I double the pressure, I've half the volume, okay? That is a graph um, that's really important. There are two other gas laws that come up in other syllabus though. So I think I'll just quickly mention those. They come up in most syllabuses actually, uh, but to more or less detail. This one is, uh, let me get this straight. This one is Charles law, okay? Uh, volume is proportional to temperature. Okay, and, and now essentially what you can do is you can measure some volumes at temperatures above zero degrees Celsius. And you can see the volume increases linearly with that, but mm, it's not proportional unless it goes through an origin, right? But if you extrapolate that line back, you do get to an origin of sorts. You get to minus 273, which we call absolute zero. So this is often used as a way to explain how we get to absolute zero, explain how we got absolute zero. And that, that's the evidence for that. And then this is the pressure law freezing point of water and you can extrapolate back and get the same value minus 273 degrees um, Celsius is zero degrees from Celsius into Kelvin. Hope that makes sense everybody. Um, if it doesn't then let me know. I don't think there's been any kind of comments and questions about that has there or has there loads of people talking about what syllabus. Seriously it doesn't matter what syllabus the physics is the same. <laughs> Okay, so just, just get on with it. I haven't got any tips for T, C2, bud, um, except just, you know, relax and enjoy it. Look at, the, look at the patterns in chemistry and make sure you can do those um, molar mass and titration type questions. Okay, so next one is about conservation of momentum and hey presto, here it is on this side, which kind of mostly been rubbed out by my kind of moving around of this thing. So I'll just quickly neaten one little part of that up. There's plenty of examples of this in the... Um, in the stuff I've just been through, all the live feeds with the questions that I've just been through. So if you want to see a worked example of this or, or four, then go back to the live feeds after I'm done with this live feed, because I want to see you all here. Can you all hit the like button? Hit the like button if we've got a good, um, healthy feed and you can see me and hear me nice and clearly. All right, I think that's okay. Okay, so how's that? All right, so the top line, okay, is the one that I would remember, okay? The top line states that m1, u1, and u is the initial velocity of something, and this is the first object, okay? We're talking about here collisions. The top line is for collisions where they don't stick together afterwards, okay? But if you know, if you know this one, you can infer the other ones. Okay, so m1, u1 plus m2, u2, that's the initial momentum, okay? Now, M1 V1 plus M2 V2 is the final momenta. Okay, so the, the sum of the initial momentum is equal to the sum of the final momentum. The only difference between this side and this side is that these are final velocities and these are initial velocities. So if in any kind of momentum conservation question you write this down and you identify all the masses, initials and finals that you know, okay, then you're only ever going to have one unknown from that and you can just work that out. Now, there's a couple of different kind of things with this. There's explosions, whereby the starting momentum is zero. But actually, if you use this, then, then this side will equal zero because both of these starting momentums, both the starting velocities will be zero. So this would be fine. This would come out just absolutely fine for you. But you can remember, an explosion is the situation where you start not moving. Two objects push equally um, and oppositely by Newton's third law, and they have equal and opposite momenta afterwards. Okay, and then lastly, this one is if they collide, so two objects with initial velocities, initial momentum collide and become one kind of mass. So this is the situation, it's just saying 
this and this mass have come together and now it's moving as one and we've got to work out the final velocity of that combined mass. And this is a really kind of common conservation momentum question, so memorise that one up. Now I'll just say as well, this or that last one's the combined mass one. Don't forget your positives and negatives. Velocity is vector. And I would normally treat left to right as you write along the page that direction as being the positive direction and right to left being uh, the negative direction. Don't forget, velocity is vector. Okay, I hope that makes sense. You know, just with those questions, memorise that, pick apart the question, what's the masses of the two, what's the initial velocities of the two, what's my unknown from this side, um, you know, and just, just, just simplify, then rearrange. As I said, there's some examples of those just on, on the playlist that I've just gone through earlier this evening and in my other exam playlists. And if you're AQA or OCR, there's full exam playlists down there. And I've just been through some Educast stuff and some Edexcel stuff, as well as some extra OCR stuff. So there's loads of questions for you to be watching this evening. Um, I'll just have a little look if there's any comments. All right. Uh, people talking about A-level stuff. I'm going to do the A-levels the day before the exam. There's loads of other things about um, A-levels. Your gas pressure, I think I've just kind of talked about gas pressure, but yeah, when you are asked to explain gas pressure, gas pressure, talk about collisions um, with the, of the particles with the container that they are in. Okay, that's the best way to kind of think about that. If you recognise and explain question, think about the particles colliding with the walls of the container. And if there's more particle collisions with the container more often, there's going to be a bigger gas pressure. Okay, and get that word in there more often, not just more. All right, I hope that helps, bud. Oh, well. AS level, my bad. Oh, yeah, yeah a -le AS levels were um, last week. Okay, 21st century, again, it's going to be pretty sim uh, similar to the OCR uh, physics, here, so um, go ahead and look at those. Certainly, all the equations are pretty similar. And you can still buy my Kindle book. You, um, you could buy the paperback if you want to memorise the equation for GCSE physics. You can see how similar the syllabus is just by looking at that. You could buy it on Kindle right now um, and get it on your phone and have a little flip for it um, tonight. Next one I'm going to go through, put my thing down. Was it circuit problems next? I think so. Circuit problems, everybody's favourite, right? OK, so um, there's some great examples of this in the two that I've been through just recently. Two different circuits, okay, series circuits, parallel circuits. Make sure you know and recognise the difference between them. Now, basically, with circuit problems, you're given, it seems like you're given too little information, right? Um, so you're asked to work out a, uh, you're asked to work out a um, current or a resistance or a voltage or a power even maybe in a, in a circuit. It seems like you don't have enough information. So what you need to do is use some of these rules to figure out the bit that you don't know. So often they'll tell you a current or a voltage uh, somewhere else in the circuit. Okay, so let's do them one by one. Let's look at the series one first. What could they tell us? Well, they tell us a current through the power pack or something, right? And we need to remember that in a series loop, the current everywhere is the same. You see, I1 equals I2 plus, uh, sorry, equals I... You see, the current everywhere in a series loop is the same. I1 equals I2 equals I3. So they could tell you the current somewhere, and you'd know that was the same elsewhere. Easy peasy. The next one is, well, they could say, they could ask you to work out, let's say, the resistance here, and you needed to know the voltage across just one of those things. And they've told you maybe the voltage across here and the voltage across here. Now, how would you work that out? Well, you need to use this rule, this top rule, Kirchhoff's second law, which is, the, to the voltage supplied, V1, is equal to the voltage 2 plus the voltage 3. So if you knew the voltage across here and the voltage across here, then this is just this one, take away this one. OK, I hope that makes sense. Those are the rules for series circuits. OK, now I'll come back to series in a moment. But what about for parallel circuits? How do Kirchhoff's laws, that's what those are, um, work for parallel circuits? OK, so they could as they did in all the ones that, I, that I've just gone through this evening, they could tell you the current through the power supply and the current through one branch, but not through the other. And you recognise you need to use the current through this branch um, to work something out. Well, OK, apply Kirchhoff's laws of currents in this case. So the current through the main branch is equal to the sum of the current through the little branches. See that? I hope that makes sense. 
So that will tell you, that will allow you to work out an unknown current, right? The other thing you need to know about parallel circuits, well, is they've all got, all those branches have a direct connection back to the power supply. So the voltage in each branch is the same. Okay, that's really as simple as it is. And then you need to just remember that you can always, at any point and through any kind of conductor or any kind of component, you can always apply Ohm's law. So if you, give, if you know I and V, you also know R. If you know R and I, you also know V. And if you know V and R, you also know I. Okay, and being able to rearrange that is a kind of core skill, obviously. There's one last little bit of Kirchhoff's laws, which is about series and parallel circuits, how resistors combine. So in a series circuit, it's this type, resistors add up. So the, the total resistance of this um, circuit is the resistance of one plus the resistance of the other. Easy peasy. Now, for many services, you actually need to calculate this, but for some, you don't. Oh, <laughs> so I've put that on the one there, left and right. Um, okay, for parallel circuits, okay, the, you work out the total resistance by adding the reciprocals. And the sum of the reciprocals is the reciprocal of the total. So essentially, you do 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 equals 1 over RT, which is the total resistance of the circuit. But for many syllabuses, you just need to know if you ever add a parallel branch, you reduce the overall resistance. So that, boys and girls, is all you really need to know for circuit problems. You need to be able to figure out unknown resistances or voltages or currents in series or parallel and then use that, um, use that along with Ohm's law. Okay, so any circuit problem you get in that exam tomorrow, the answer is going to be, you're going to be able to figure that out using one of those tools. They aren't the answers, they're the tools to solving the problem. I hope that makes sense. Right, a um, couple of questions on this and that. Last minute is quite where you're at. I like it. Uh, I think there's not much there so far. You'll see your responses when you check them. Yes, there we are. I think we're doing... With the first year doing 21st century and I, I don't know what the rest of it. Could you quickly go over moments? Um, yeah, there's a, certainly there's a question on moments. I'll really quickly run through that. I'm not going to have time to sort of write stuff out on a board, but essentially the principle of moments is clockwise moment equals anti-clockwise moment. So you just need to look at all of the force times distances on one side, make that equal to all the force times distance on the other side. It'll be a similar type of calculation to the momentum one where you've just got only one unknown, you've told you all the other things you need to know, just get clockwise and anti-clockwise moments on either side of an equal sign, work out what you can work out, and then rearrange for the unknown. All right, I hope that makes sense. Any other little bits? Can I say what my predictions are? We'll talk about this actually today. I'd rather really not, I mean, because, well, for a start, there's so many different exam boards, and anything could come up, so there's no point in me telling you to revise something heavy and it not coming up. I'm pretty sure there's going to be a conservation of momentum because there always is. I'm pretty sure there's going to be something on um, where, uh, where to put your multi your meters. Um, so you always put voltmeters across things in parallel and uh, ammeters in series with things. Okay, that's a usual kind of question they ask you. And one of the pags that I haven't seen come up quite a lot is, is um, the series and parallel pags. One of the reasons I've gone through that. So how do you measure the uh, current and voltage accurately? And the other one is, um, it's come, one that has come up a lot is like acceleration down ramps and things. So I, I, I kind of, well, kind of half expecting that to come up as well. But anyway, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't really worry about that. I'd just go over the whole thing, make sure you know your required practicals, make sure you know your, your equations, rely on yourself to solve the problems in the exam using what you know, okay? All right. The last little bit we were asked for was half-life so i just do half-life now, and then I'll sign off. But any questions, then ask them now, because I am out of here in, like, half an hour. I'll just do a quick plug, though, as a lot of people here as well, um, that I'm looking to get to 10K subscribers, OK? So if you're wondering why I'm still here at half past six um, doing this live feed for you, it is to help you. I really do want to help you guys out. But also, I want to get to 10K subscribers, because if I get to 10K subscribers, then I get what's called a community tab. You've probably seen that in some of your favourite YouTubers. And that means that I can put out posts, I can share other people's stuff, and I can share what I think is useful for you guys to learn. So can you help me by sharing out what, um, what I'm doing here? Maybe you can send these live feeds out uh, to your mates on your WhatsApp. That was really useful to me, something like that, um, to your mates. 
so that I get more people. So the more subs really, it's really actually very useful to me right now and where I am in my kind of YouTube um, channel. I hope this is useful to you. I really do, I'm passionate about that. Actually helping more people understand more, so they enjoy physics more, because physics is amazing really, um, and get more confident and then do better in the exams. Right, half-life then, and then any last questions. This is the typical graph that you're gonna have to look at for a half-life, right? It's what's called an exponential decay, but don't worry too much about that. Essentially, the, whatever is the y, variable, the y variable doesn't matter that much, but I've put n, which means number of undecayed nuclei, right? Now, all you have to gonna do, if you get given a graph like this and has to work out the half-life, is you look at the line and you work out half of the y variable, go across to the line and then down to the time. Now, whatever that time is, that time is the half-life. Now, strictly speaking, you should probably do two because the half-life is defined as the average time taken, okay, for something to decay by half. But you should, hopefully you should notice by my crudely drawn curve here that that time there is equal to that time there. Now, throughout this entire curve, the time taken for half is always going to be the same, right? Um, now, that's because nuclear decay is completely random. So when something's random, we can only really know the, um, the probability of something decaying at any given point, right? So if we only know the probability of something decaying, then we need really large numbers of things to actually make any kind of statistical um, conclusions at all. And that's where this graph comes in. I've just done the lesson actually with my year 10 today, where we got whole trays full of dice, and we rolled dice, and we took out all the sixes every single term, and we got that curve, roughly, right? Um, but in terms of nuclear physics, we're talking about huge, huge, huge numbers, okay, 10 to the 28 kind of atoms in every single kind of kilogram of, um, of uh, materials, right? So huge, huge, huge numbers. And um, that means that statistically, it always works out in that curve there. Now, often though, you, you don't get given a curve, you get told maybe what the half-life is, and you get told how much of a sample is left. Or you get told maybe, like, predict how much is left after a certain number of times. So it's worthwhile just actually figuring this out in your head, right? Okay, at time zero, you've got one. You've got all of the sample. Now, it might be 100, it might be 1,000, it might be 6 million, I don't know, it doesn't matter, but you've got the total at time zero. After the first half-life, let's just call that time one for simplicity's sake, then you've got half of that number. And it could be, it doesn't have to be anything, it could, could be activity there as well, it could be number uh, of undecayed nuclei, or it could be activity, how many are, are decaying per second or per minute or whatever. Right, so that number doesn't really matter. So first, at time zero, you've got all of them. At time one, first half-life, you've got half of them. At time two, second half-life, you've got a quarter of them. At time three, you've got an eighth of them because it's halved three times. At time four, it's halved four times, so you have a sixteenth. And that really is kind of often the kind of thing, just actually figuring out in your head, right, that number is my starting number, that's my final number. In my calculator, divide by two equals, divide by two equals, divide by two equals, divide by two equals, okay, that's that final number, so that's been four half-lives. Multiply that by the value of the half-life, the time taken to half, and you've got the age, you've got the age of that thing, you've got time in total. Hope that makes sense, okay. Um, let's have a little look through what we've got so far. Did moments. Square, circuits on paper two. They perhaps are on paper two for LXO exam board. Um, they were in that question that I went through just now, they weren't they? So I thought that was a paper one one, could be wrong. Um, different exam boards have different topics in different places, definitely. Can you explain how lightning is made? Actually, in the question, Mrs. Ms. O, um, that I went through from the Educast, which is in the last live feed, there is actually a question that goes through that. So that's a really good one. It's basically uh, static electricity. So friction, transfer of electrons, charge, therefore you've got a potential difference, therefore a current will flow. If you look up Gorilla Physics um, Sparks as well, there's a video where I talk through how a Van der Graaff generator works, which might help you with that. This is really gammy sometimes, this um, little chat function on this. Just kick this guy. Acceleration practical, again, so that's in, that's in the playlist, uh, do that. How sad is your life to be insulted at teacher? <laughs> like it. Yeah, you know, education is pretty awesome, okay, and I'm glad to be involved in education. I'm glad so many people are here um, doing the right thing, and there's going to be loads of people I know are going to watch this not live, 
Okay, not going to stop and do nuclear fission, fusion and nuclear fission right now, except to say, okay, right, fusion is small nuclei joining to make big ones, and fission is big uh, nuclei uh, splitting to make small. All right. Yeah, thank you very much for watching this video, and don't forget to like it, please. Can I just see the like number go up? There's 33 people watching right now. Let's just bang through um, some likes. I will do Newton's Law if I get a few likes right now. That's, um, my, yeah, it's right. You're going to close me off and I'm going, yep, yep, that's fine. And Newton's laws, Newton's first law, okay, if there's no resultant force, there's no acceleration. Newton's uh, t second law is resultant force is proportional to acceleration by mass, so F equals MA. And that's it, yeah. I'll see you later, guys. No.